Well, I would like to thank all of you for being here in person on such a beautiful day, right? It looks awfully nice out there on the green today. Um, and I'd also like to thank our virtual guests for attending remotely. Um, it's such a wonderful way to bring these programs to people around the country and around the world. Um, the Bernard Nosseter D. Nosseter Lecture Series was established by the Nosseter family back in 1994 in honor of Bernard D. Nosseter, Dartmouth Class of 47, and his contributions to journalism. This fellowship series supports lectures by Harvard University's Neiman Fellows to be held at Dartmouth College under the auspices of the Rockefeller Center. Bernard D. Nosseter was a reporter for the Washington Post for 24 years. From 1979 to 1983, he was chief of the United Nations Bureau of the New York Times. We are so pleased to have Bernard's son here today, Adam Nosseter, who himself is a notable and interesting journalist. Adam has been a staff writer for the New York Times, and before that, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He's been the bureau chief in Kabul, Paris, West Africa, and New Orleans. Adam led the team that won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for coverage of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. He's also won other notable awards in journalism. He's now a senior staff editor for the New York Times, and he's been writing about the South for decades now at this point, and he lives in New Orleans. He's also the author of two New York Times notable books, and the list goes on. Above all, Adam Nosseter carries on the family tradition of supporting an honest and open um, search for truth, education, and understanding. Adam, thank you for being here and for supporting this program and these rich opportunities for our students and community. Um, please come up here and tell us a bit about your father and about your relationship with Fahim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah, for that excessively generous introduction. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Um, before I introduce Fahim, my great colleague, I want to say a few words about my father, uh, Bernard Nosseter. Dartmouth class of 1947, uh, and about why my brothers and I established this event in his name uh, almost 30 years ago. Um, to us, he uh, represented um, some very basic principles of journalism, and we hope that with this lecture, uh, we can at least um, pretend to keep them alive. Um, Bernard Nosseter had a career in journalism and writing that spanned 40 years, mostly for the Washington Post. His focus was economic policy and how it was distorted by corporate capitalism. And more broadly, his focus was on power and its abuses. He covered the Kennedy administration and its economic policy in Washington in the early 1960s for the Washington Post. He covered the post-World War II economic resurgence of Europe from his base in Paris in the mid-1960s. He covered India as Southeast Asia bureau chief in New Delhi. He covered the 1968 presidential campaign in American politics from Washington. And then he was sent to United Kingdom as the Washington Post London bureau chief in 1971. Finally, at the end of his career, he covered the United Nations for the New York Times. Along the way, he covered wars in Israel, notably, coup d'etat in Greece and elsewhere, assorted conflicts in Northern Ireland, Cyprus and elsewhere, economic development in India and what was then called the Third World. He generally felt lucky to be doing what he was doing, except when he was fighting with his editors, which was very often. And, and I have vivid memories from my childhood of furious transatlantic harangues over the costly transatlantic film. He wrote a half a dozen books and he won numerous prizes. My father was deeply convinced that journalism is a useful profession. He took it seriously, which isn't to say that he took himself seriously, but at a basic level he thought that journalism was essential. Because when he looked at the world he saw the powerful who inevitably tended to abuse their power and to lie, 
He saw destructive greed, which he thought was a basic motivating principle of humans that had to be called out wherever possible. And he saw ideologies and rhetoric which inevitably obscured the truth. He was generally suspicious of the policies that supposedly wise men concocted. And he always had a sharp eye out for the way big business distorted these policies with generally negative effects for the average citizen. He was old enough to have been drafted in World War II and he had a grunt's eye view of the military establishment and was particularly suspicious of the Pentagon in America's enormous defense budgets, which he denounced often. <clears throat> the only independent actor, in his view, in what is now called civil society, who could call all this out and shout it from the rooftops was, a, was the journalist. And what he saw as the best posture of the journalist, deep skepticism, was a natural fit for him and one he felt quite comfortable with. It meant that he was going to relentlessly question the pretensions of the powerful, and especially as an economic specialist, big business, and assume that the little guy, the underpaid worker, the low-level clerk, was going to get the shaft. He once wrote about himself, I wanted both to explain and to scourge. He paid attention to detail, the patient attention to fact and observation that establishes the journalist's credibility. So it was to memorialize these foundational aspects of the journalist's craft, my father's credo, skepticism, analysis, respect for facts and truth, that my brothers and I established what at first was the Nossiter Prize and is now the Nossiter Lecture. He would have urged the younger people in this audience to consider a career in journalism, and I do too. And now uh, to my colleague, Fahim, uh, who is the perfect person to take up the cudgel for my father. In the seven months that I was the New York Times bureau chief in Kabul, Fahim was my indispensable friend and collaborator. The bureau could not have operated without him. Most mornings, the ritual was the same. I would walk over to Fahim's office in our little compound and find out what to think for the day. The atmosphere in those last seven months was very tense as the Taliban closed in from everywhere. Fahim had his family to worry about. As someone who worked with Americans, he was perfectly aware that he could be targeted if the government fell, which it was going to do. None of us knew when, but we knew it was going to happen. Fahim kept his cool. He has a rare combination of talents, all of which make him a great journalist analytical acuity, calm, and excellent news judgment. There were two, and at the end, three Americans in the Bureau. None of us would have known what was going on without Fahim. We were lost without him. The government, the dying government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, as it called itself, would say something, it would make a pronouncement, and Fahim would immediately be skeptical. My father would have approved in the face of a security situation that was rapidly deteriorating every day, Fahim kept his cool and advised the Bureau on the best way forward. I'm very happy to introduce him here today. Uh, but before I do, I want to say something about Professor Brooks and thank her very much for uh, moderating this. Um, professor Brooks is an associate professor of government. She teaches courses on the media and US politics, political advertising, and women and politics. She previously worked as a senior research director at the Gallup organization, and she is the author of He Runs, She Runs, Why Gender Stereotypes Do Not Harm Women Candidates. She got her PhD in political science with distinction from Yale University. Thank you. Thank you very much, and before we're gonna handle this today by I'm going to be asking Fahim some questions to start us off and cover some of the foundational um, things that brought him here today. Um, but first, I want to tell you about some of the things he's been doing lately, his biographical um, information, so that we don't need to 
you know, spend too much time on that today. Um, he's currently a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, as well as a visual journalist at the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania now, and has been since 2022. And that's as part of the World Association of News Publishers Afghan Journalists Appeal Program. And so the interesting thing here in with this talk is that I can fill an hour with learning from any journalist from anywhere, and then he has so many other interesting things to bring to the table in terms of culture and in terms of leaving a country that was in chaos um, and as being an expert in that country. So this is just fascinating that. Um, you've heard about um, from, from Adam Nasseter a bit about his time in Afghanistan, and we're certainly going to be spending more time on that. But of course, everything changed on August 15th, 2000. Um, 21, and so you know, there's kind of the before times and the after times, and we'll be talking about all of that. Um, at that point, Fahim was evacuated from Afghanistan. I mean, I, I think you know that that was the outcome. Um, and with a you know, spoiler alert, um, with a number of his colleagues, and then he relocated to the United States. Um, but before that, prior to joining the New York Times in 2016, he worked as a producer and reporter with Turkey's Andalo Agency, the BBC World Service, and various outlets in Afghanistan. He's a 2019 alumni of the East-West Center Fellowship um, Program and the Afghanistan Observatory Scholar Program with New America. And he's also a graduate of Kabul University. So I'm also so pleased to welcome Fahid Abed to the Rockefeller Center and to Dartmouth College. Thank you so much for being here to share your story with us. Um, and I want to point out to our remote audience, I'll be able to take some live questions um, during this talk um, from our audience, but also our friends attending virtually can submit questions for our speaker by emailing rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. It helps if you keep the questions kind of short, they're more likely to get picked that way. Um, okay, so thank you so much. And so tell us, Fahim, I think I'll start out with the big question, but why do you do what you do? Thank you so much for having me and welcome everyone for, thank you everyone for coming here. Uh, the reason I, I do what I do is, uh, it's, it's a quite complicated question and uh, it's, it's, it has roots in my childhood. Uh, I was nine years old when I was sent to exile by my family to the north of the country and there, um, I, I, I learned how to read and write, and I started writing letters to my family. So I, I didn't know anyone, and um, I couldn't speak the language in North. It was different than the language we spoke in East. So I, I, the way I started communicating was to write, and, and that was like writing become became my friend, and then uh, so I would write a letter every week and send it to my family and brief them that what I was doing through the week and then I was waiting for a letter from them that would show up once a month or so. And then uh, after that, like uh, when my year in exile was completed, my family also joined me in North and then uh, my sisters and everyone was able to go to school, and uh, I, I ended up in a Turkish school in, in mazar -e sharif it's a city in the north. And there, uh, like, we had these small magazines and walls, and like, everyone would write an article and post it there. And then I went to the headmaster and said, like, why we don't have, like, a paper magazine, an actual magazine? And he said, it's a lot of work, and like, we can provide the resources, but who will do that? I said, I will do that. He said, are you sure? It's, it's, it's so much work. Like, I was in the ninth grade then, in the high school. And I said, yeah, yeah, like, we have other students, and they will help. And we started this magazine. It, the, like, it, it was supposed to be a monthly magazine, but for the first version, it took us, like, maybe two months to prepare it, and, and then, Everyone liked it. We were able to write the stories from students in the school to like 
vendors on the street who were selling cold water in, in around the Blue Mosque in mazar sharif and students who were washing cars and, and studying at the same time. And then I, I liked telling these stories, and, and I kept writing news stories every day. And then, like when, when I was going to the national exam for university, I, I kind of had the idea that I want to become a journalist, but it was not a, like, it, you, we all know that you, you don't learn a lot of money if you're a journalist. So um, my parents were kind of hesitative because I was the first person in our family who has ever been to university, and they thought, like, if they invest in me, now I should pay it back. And, like, my, my dad was not happy, but I was pushy, and, and eventually I convinced him. And then I, I, I went to Kabul University. I went to the journalism school there. And in my second year, I, I started writing news stories with a local FM station. And then I, I like it more because like I, I, I started attending press conferences. And then I, I, I pitched feature ideas to, uh, to my editors. And they, they, they kind of liked it. And, and then I said, yeah, you can work on it. And, and then th that, that's how like, I, I kept engaging in journalism. And, uh, after graduation from university, I was able to start working with BBC. I got a job. It was very competitive at that time. And then, like, so I, I was listening to BBC when I was very young because my dad's morning routine was to listen to news. And, like, I was so excited that, like, names, I was always hearing them. I was colleague with them, and I, we were working together in newsrooms. Um, so, uh, uh, like I, I, I keep writing stories about uh, politicians and, and MPs, and then like it, it was very early in my career that I, I, I write a story about one of the uh, parliament members in Afghanistan who who was using uh, fake license plates for his car because it was like armored SUVs and it was very expensive to get the SUV license plate. And then uh, so. I, I, I asked him for an interview, and he said, yeah, why not? And then he talked to me. We, we published the story. And then he called me, and he said he didn't know it was going to publish in BBC. I said, yeah, but I told you that I was a journalist with BBC. He told me, get off that story. And I said, no, it's not possible now. So he, he didn't know the, the And then he said, like, if I find you, I will kill you. And I had to spend like a week in the very beginning of my career in office, like I was just locked and the security wouldn't let me go out. And then they talked with that warlord and convinced him that like it, you was under record and everything was under record. So like you should have known it. And um, so uh, after a while I thought um, I should tell my stories to, to, to a broader audience and to, to have more impact. And in, in Afghanistan, like places like New York Times was a very big deal. The president would always read the Times. So I started looking for opportunities. And then I got this position with the Times that I was contributing at the first point. And then like, I got a little bit of space to write my own stories. And like I, I didn't thought uh, I was doing a very risky job until like I find myself in front lines and covering the war and and like anything I would tweet it would get a lot of attention and then then I I, I understand the power of journalism at that time and then like I I start to work on stories that was important and like we we did a story in Afghanistan on a group of uh, militia that was like promised to be paid, but they were never paid, and they were deceived, they were sent to the front lines. And after that, like, the commander who was doing this, he was fired, and uh, they, they stopped uh, hiding people without paying them. And, and those impacts, like, I, 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 I kind of started liking journalism, and I was really enjoying what I was doing. But then with the collapse of the government in August 2021, everything ended, and here I am. <laughs> Here you are. Um, and so tell us about those months and weeks leading up 
to August 15th. What were those like? Where it sounds like you knew that this was going to happen, it was a matter of when, but what, what did that feel like for those months? Yeah, so uh, when, when Adam uh, joined the Bureau, it, the situation was changing rapidly and there was like a hundred outposts surrendered to the Taliban in south of the country and we understand it was like a deal more than fighting because they, they all collapsed at the same time in different districts in the same province. And then, uh, like, Adam's, Adam told me that um, a collapse is inevitable, but we don't know when it will happen. I didn't know the word. Then I went, like, Google translated, and I said, like, wow, that is, like, crazy. It's happening, but we don't know when it will happen. And because we were so into this war and we were covering and we kind of got used to it we were receiving treats and then we would say okay everything is fine like we would find ways to 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 cope with those treats like i was leaving for some time with my friends with family like i would not go to my apartment all the time and we were but always a, a foreign opinion was very important because we thought they were seeing things more clearly than we were seeing but um, like three months before the collapse, 200 districts, co uh, oh, like out of 400 districts in the country collapsed to the Taliban. And then the government was saying that they were tactically retreating and then they would recapture those places. But, but we knew that was not the reality, that was not gonna happen because the Taliban were pushing very hard and with capture of every district, they would uh, capture a lot of ammunition and weapons and uh, m many of the soldiers would surrender to them. So then they, they were becoming more stronger. As well. So we, we had a map of Afghanistan in our office and like every part that would collapse, we would have a circle on that and these circles were growing up every day more and more but we were as I said like we, we were living inside that and we, we never thought about the collapse of Kabul and, and the Taliban were also making statements that Kabul will not collapse we will not attack Kabul and we will wait until there is like a, a, a government uh, that comes out of uh, negotiations and, and the government was sending all these teams for negotiations to Qatar and, and Doha and, and like but it, it was like um, like every district every village that would collapse we would have some family and friends and relatives there and I, I, I dedicated myself completely to the work I thought it's important because at that point our our big goal was to to get some attention from Americans, from, from, from the officials here, to like reverse or change their decision about the troop withdrawals, because that was the main factor in collapse. Like when, when that was, the date was announced, uh, Afghan soldiers were not fighting anymore, because they knew that, that and, and the Taliban would, would come to them and say like, okay, we have this deal with Americans, and there's, they will hand over us everything. Why you are trying to kill yourself? Like you should just surrender, and and go, and and we will uh, we will give you money for for a bus. We will give you like a couple uh, clothes and other stuff. And, and why why you are risking your life? And and soldiers were listening to them. So uh, then like with with the collapse of uh, big provinces, I I started panicking because my, my sister was living in one of the provinces and her husband was working in the uh, Afghan intelligence and then when that collapsed they had to come to the capital and then I, I was always on the move, I was not living in my own apartment so I was not able to host them and things got very much complicated and then I, I like the way I felt covering the war at that time it was like when you have a fire in your house and, and your family is stuck there and like you need to cover that fire as well. It, 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 it was very difficult. And then like I had to uh, emotionally support my colleagues in office as well because they would show up every morning and they would say like, what's the plan for us? Like, 
if the government collapsed, would they be liquidators or not? Because everyone who had like an affiliation with Americans, they were under risk. And it was, it was a bit difficult to make those in New York to understand the situation because out of comfort of New York, you wouldn't understand the situation on the ground. And they would say like, no, nothing will happen. The Taliban will not attack the, the capital and you will be fine. And then our colleagues in Kabul, they, they had to push really hard to, to convince them. But uh, we, we thought we have time. Like on the day of collapse, I, I had enough saving in my bank account, but I didn't have any money in my pocket. Like I, I never thought about it. And, and the, the logic behind that was that I thought the country was more important than like my personal situation. And then when the collapse happened, I said, oh, no, like now I have to figure out what to do. Like um, we, we were told by, by our security colleagues and in the bureau that we should go somewhere close to the airport with backpacks. And when I called my wife and said, like, we are going to the airport with backpacks, she said, what backpack? Like I have made this house for 12 years. How I can fit them in backpacks? And I said, well, there is another possibility. You can pack everything, and we will have to leave them behind in the airport. So you pick whatever you want. <laughs> and, and, and like she just cried. She said, I, I, I don't know what to do. And like in an hour, we find ourselves in the airport. It was 15th of August. We were supposed to go to Ukraine. The Times um, had a charter flight. But then. Everyone on that day heard that, okay, you should go to the airport because the Taliban are coming and that's the only safe place. And then you may get a chance to leave. Because many people living in Kabul, they were kind of affiliated with government or with Americans or with foreign organizations. So we, our flight was to take over by uh, officials and other people, so we couldn't make it to the flight. We, 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 we were very close to the aircraft, but uh, the gates were closed, and the pilot said that they can take us. We had to spend the night in a parking lot in the airport with all the families. So, and we had a uh, drawn from American forces because we were communicating with them, with the Marines, and they said, like, we, we are coming, we will get you, we are coming. But the situation in the airport was not letting that happen because there were a lot of people and, and th they would follow any movement. Like if anyone would move from one side of the airport to the other side, the whole group of people would follow them and there were like thousands of them or ten thousand of them. So then uh, we, in the morning, like we ran out of milk for babies, we, we ran out of food, we didn't have anything. and. The city was closed, there was nothing. One of our colleagues managed to come afterward to the airport. He brought some bread and water. And then the Americans were saying every minute that like we will find a way and we will get you. And, and eventually they, they asked us to walk to the military side of the airport. And when we, we managed to get to the military side at this moment, and all the the crowd also entered to that part, and the Taliban also came there. So that they, they start asking people what they were doing there, and and when they ask our group, so we were having all the women and children inside a circle, and the male members of the group were surrounding them, and then they said like, why you are doing this? What are you here for? And we said like, we are journalists, and we are being evacuated, so we are waiting for our flight. And they, they start like beating everyone and they start shooting at toward us. Then uh, uh, we thought maybe we should leave. But this was the time that we were communicating with Marines and they were asking us to like have ways to communicate with them that we are with the, from the Times. Then we had two kids in the group that were wearing red clothes. So we had them in front of the group and we started walking toward the marriage. And then at that moment, like a, a bigger and much aggressive group of the Taliban attacked us. And they, they start like basically beating everyone. And, and we realized it was not possible to, to reach to the marriage at that point. So we, we left the airport. 
and when we reached the exit of the airport, the Taliban had blocked that, so like only one person could could cross, and there were like tens of thousands of people. We were stuck there, like I I had my son uh, in my arms. He was like nine months old then. He couldn't breathe, and like when I would set him on my shoulder, the Taliban were firing to the air, and then like I was worried that they may hit him. Then I would have him in my arms, and then he couldn't breathe. So we walked to the. Eventually, we made our way, and we find a taxi, and then like. My, my wife was just crying and she was saying like, you shouldn't talk to them. Like, just, if they stop you, just, just let me talk to them. And, and, and like, you should say that you're, you, you can't talk and you can't speak. And like, the impression was that like, the first check post that will stop us, they will know that we, we have worked for, for, for Americans and they will know that we were journalists and they will just take us. That was the impression and then we, that's, that's how we, it felt like all the way of like maybe an hour drive to my mother-in-law's house, and then when when we arrived there, so it was all fine. And but like I was not allowed to speak in English over the phone with my colleagues, and they said no, don't do that. Like they were not able to take you out, so they won't be able to do it after this. But like you shouldn't risk your life. And but still, I would get calls from my colleagues, and like when I would answer the phone, like they would drag me to the kitchen or, or like to, to a room that was far away from the neighbor's rooms so they, they don't hear me. So we spent three nights there and then with the help of Qataris we were again able to manage and get to the airport. And, and on, on the, the day of collapse, like we were in the airport that when we saw people who were dragging to these aircrafts and they, they fell when, when the aircraft was flying. So um, then we, we, we fly to Qatar and then we spend a week there and then we had a, like 40 hours flights from Qatar to Mexico all the way in a military aircraft and then after that we, uh, we spend a week in Mexico and then Homeland Security agreed to, to give us like uh, access and uh, visas in the border so we, we, we were flown to Houston and then we got there our visas there, and yeah. Okay, <laughs> there's so much to talk about here. Let me just keep an eye on time because I want to leave time for questions too. So you get to Houston, you've got a nine month old, you've got your wife, and do you have other people you know with you there in Houston or it's just the three of you? We, we were with our colleagues and okay. their families, yeah, and, and we, like 10 of the families, we end up in the same complex. And then what do you do? I had no idea. So I was, so initially the Times promised that I will have my job, but I, I, I was not very sure because I thought, uh, like, let, let, let's see what happens. So I was waiting for my work permit, and during that time I applied for, for Newman Fellowship and for some other fellowships. And like I, I, I didn't know what to do. Um, so when I got my work permit, I didn't hear that back from any of these things. And then I talked with some of the Afghan community people there, and they told me that like you will not be able to find any job in journalism or like in your own profession. So maybe like you should go and do like a tracking class or something, or like like these are the things that you can make money in the U.S. and because I was kind of lost, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I thought maybe, yeah, that, that tracking is a good idea because that was the first thing I heard. And then we got enrolled in a tracking school with a bunch of other journalists. So <laughs> we went through this like one week practice, uh, the, like the, the theories, and then after one week they made us sit behind the wheel. And like when I said, I said, oh God, this is so big. I said, then, <laughs> like, I, I can't do this. <laughs> you can handle like a war torn civil strife and escaping that, but the truck driving, no. Yeah, <laughs> like, I it's said, just a step too far. This, is, this is not possible. So then my work permit came in and, and I talked with the Times and they said, no, we, we won't be able to uh, give you any work. 
so I, I just like kept applying for anything and then I was struggling so much. So the first thing that came up was this job in Pittsburgh at the Tribune Review. And then I, I, I didn't know how to move because we have, when we arrived to Houston, we thought we would be living here forever. And then the job, they said, well, you need to move. And I said, oh, like how we will move? And we bought a lot of stuff. Like we had a house set up. And then like I, I talked with some of my American friends and they said, maybe you can like rent a U-Haul and like then tow it because I had a car. Then we rent a U-Haul and like put everything there and drive like for 40 hours from Houston to Pittsburgh. So you got to be a truck driver after all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So in Pittsburgh, like when we arrived in the first band, I got this fellowship and I was so excited. I came to my wife and said, I got this fellowship at Harvard. She said, what? Are we moving again? I said, yeah, that's that's true. And, and she said, no, like it, it, it's too much and we can't do that. And then we said, okay, like we will find a furnished place and like make it easier and then put our stuff. So then in, in after four months in Pittsburgh, we moved to Cambridge in like almost a year we have been there. Okay, and you're still working for the Pittsburgh Tribune, correct? Or you're doing full-time Neiman? No, fellowship? the Neiman Fellowship is full-time, so I'm not working for them anymore. Okay. Um, well, there's so many other things I could ask, but right now I want to turn to, I've had the great fortune of having Marsal Ahan in my um, Media and Politics first year seminar, and she too left Afghanistan um, a year later. She had a year under the Taliban, correct? Um, and so I asked her if she would want to ask the first question, the first audience question today. Okay. So um, if you could, yeah, thank you. Hi, and welcome to Dartmouth. We're really proud of you, actually. I have two questions, one before coming to United States and one after. What are your thoughts on media coverage on Afghanistan in the United States? How does this can be compared to the coverage from international sources? And how might the, the perspective of a local Afghan journalist who worked for the New York Times can be deferred from these accounts? My second question is, that's happening right now, like nowadays. As you're aware, numerous global conflicts and issues, including Ukraine and Russia war, made the international communities turn their attention away from Afghanistan, despite all the problems that are going on in Afghanistan. What do you think can be done to bring the world's attention back to Afghanistan conflict and problems? Thank you. Those were some good questions, Marcel. Thank you, Marcel John. Uh, so, for, for, for the first question, um, I think Afghanistan is um, an old story for the U.S. outlets now. Like they think it's over, they can't do anything about it anymore, so there's very little attention or there is no attention at all. And, and the problem is that like there are so many things happening that right now in Afghanistan and because the bigger outlets are not reporting on it, so people think, okay, everything is fine with Afghanistan. They, the, the, the American outlets has a presence in Afghanistan, but they don't want to do the stories that will challenge their presence, because if they do any story and if the Taliban don't like it, they will kick them out, and they don't want that to happen. So they, they are super cautious, they are doing like, stories on poverty and it's like the same stuff reported over and over again. But the bigger story that the Taliban atrocities and the killings they are doing every day, every day there is news from Afghanistan that this person was killed, this person was kidnapped, this person was arrested, but no one is reporting on that in, in the bigger, uh, in the broader picture. And what was your second question? Second question was, as you're aware of like numerous global challenges that is going on in the world, including Ukraine Russia war, how can like how can that affect it, international communities to turn their face from Afghanistan? And what can be done to bring back their focus? I, I think um, 
the, the case of Ukraine was one of the main thing that uh, put Afghanistan in this ignorant spot and like because there's so much happening in Ukraine and it, it, it's a battleground so like for, for journalists and, 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 and there are very limited resources for media so all resources go there so to, to bring back some of the attention to Afghanistan, I think uh, like w we as journalists in exile should try our best to, to do high quality stories and, and remind them that they ignored Afghanistan in the 90s and then 9-11 happened. That, that, will, that may happen again. And now like, there are so many terrorist groups in Afghanistan. And also like the problem with the US is that there is a narrative by Zalmay Khalilzad that like, okay, everything is fine with the Taliban and we are safe, we wanted to get out, we got out and everything is good, but we, we need to do uh, more investigative stories to, to challenge the narrative of the Taliban that there are still terrorist groups there that are getting stronger every day and like the, 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 the leader of Al-Qaeda was killed in Kabul in a US airstrike. But, but it was never reported widely by media outlets. It just like the news was reported and, and the Taliban said they started an investigation but no one followed up on that. So more media coverage will help I think. Um, I'd like to remind our remote um, attendees that you can email questions to rockyqna at dartmouth.edu and those questions will be brought up to me at some point. Um, are there other questions or I've got plenty of questions so um, yes and introduce yourself um, before you ask your question please. Uh, thank you so much my name is Arif I'm also originally from Afghanistan class of 26 potential major of international relations and economics it's a pleasure to listen to your story and Mr. Abid so I have one well I had many questions so I, I have to stick to one of, of them. So one question that I would like to ask you is about the Afghanistan National Security and Defense uh, uh, Forces. Uh, there, after the collapse of the country or the republic, there has been a sort of media coverage that they have uh, presented the security forces of Afghanistan as is very uh, covered, not very brave, and they did not, they, like, despite the trillion, sorry, billions of the dollars that were spent in order to build the army of Afghanistan, but just in a matter of like three months, they, uh, they lost the war to Taliban. So you as a journalist who worked in Afghanistan, and also as you mentioned during your talk, that uh, you went to the front line and, and you covered so many stories. So, can you give like a story or like a narrative or your own uh, opinion about how the, the soldiers were fighting in order to uh, preserve democracy and the republic values? Because it's my own personal uh, account that I have heard with them in multiple times that I have listened to their stories. They said that we were never going to put down our arms and we were always there to fight despite all the corruptions and all those things that, th that they were not given even their uh, salaries and those all things. But they were saying that we were never going to give up to the Taliban, but it was just the leaders that did not really allow us. So it was not a military defeat, but more is a more leadership defeat. So I want to hear your opinion and what you know about this case. Thank you so much. So uh, b one week before the collapse of the government, I was in Kandahar with, with a couple of my American colleagues and we spent two nights in the front line which was very close to the city it was on the verge of the city and uh, we were in bad with the uh, CR units they were like counter-terrorism units and they were like the, one of the very elite forces of the country and on that day like they had one machine gun in the whole unit of like maybe 25 people and the machine gun would stop working like every five minutes and then they had to spend like a couple hours to fix it and then it would stop working again and again and again. And like they had, they had like a stick that they were using to, to put ballots to their magazine 
and like that was fire one magazine like maybe in five seconds but it would take them like maybe 20 minutes or half an hour to fill it back so yeah that, that they were committed to fighting but they didn't have the resources like they they, they were facing ammunition shortage and they were like even when they were very close to the front lines were very close to the city there was no food in in front lines that the commanders were still stealing the money and they were not sending them food and the other fact is that the afghan army was built on a u.s model that uh, was designed very much dependent on the air force but there was no air force like there was a very limited air force and also uh, u.s government rapidly canceled the contracts for the maintenance of those uh, aircraft so like they didn't have laser guide bombs they didn't have proper maintenance for for the aircraft and and they couldn't fly those aircraft when when they were out of the maintenance so like it doesn't make sense if you don't have uh, what you need to fight like there were many soldiers who were crying when 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 they were asked to surrender and, and they didn't want to surrender, but they, they were also not able to fight. That's why like, so many soldiers were surrendering, because they didn't have ammunition, they didn't have enough fuel for their cars, and they didn't have... The, 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 their leadership was very corrupt, and, and uh, until the very last moment, uh, they didn't provide enough support. And also, like the the U.S. government canceled many of the contracts rapidly, and and because of that, uh, they, they they couldn't supply resources for the army. So th that's why the army fell apart. Like, yeah, that's true. They they spent billions of dollars on the Afghan army, but it doesn't mean like army is not like a like a car that if you build it, you don't need to maintain it. It it, it needs money to to operate, and and that resources were not there. Anymore. Okay, I can take another question from the audience. I see a hand back there. Introduce yourself, please. Josh, um, a friend of our Reefs, actually, both international relations majors. Um, my question has to do more with the issue of human rights and the, Amer the American military occupation in Afghanistan and in Iraq as a whole. I think the last 20 years of American foreign policy have been kind of shameful in that regard. So what can we do as allies who sort of did so poorly by did so wrong by Af Afghanis what can we do to help Afghanis who are living under in such in such a terrible situation now because of a lot of the decisions that we made in our nation building efforts I think um, Americans can put more pressure on the government you have like um, a government that respects sort of respects your opinion like you 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 can put pressure on them uh, to like put more sanctions on the Taliban and and uh, restrict more of the Taliban and and, and not uh, like blindly send money to Afghanistan and hope that it will reach to the poor people that that money is also going to the Taliban the aid money that these NGOs claim that this money is going to uh, help poor people. Yeah, it's helping part of poor people, but it's also going to the Taliban, a, a, a big amount of it. And also, like, uh, you still has strong influence over Pakistan, and Pakistan is in a very bad situation now, so they can, can use that leverage. But uh, th th for, for, for the US politicians, they don't want to talk about Afghanistan. And, and, and until they don't get out of that uh, mindset and, and don't remind themselves of 9-11, it, it won't change anything. And, and for, the, like the public will pay for it if, if something happens again like that. So it, it's for public to, to now put pressure on the government. I'd like to ask you a question about other journalists in Afghanistan. You, you came with some, but others are presumably still there. And how has life changed for them? Presumably for female journalists in Afghanistan, they're, have, they're not allowed to do that work, correct? 
Um, but can you tell us about the, the colleagues that are left behind? So uh, many of the male colleagues, they had to give up on journalism because it's, it's very risky. Uh, like they can be arrested after doing any story. And the second thing is that um, uh, like there are a lot of abductions that uh, people went missing and no one find where they are. And, and so because of that, many of them give up on journalism. And now like, I, I know quite a lot of journalists who work in bakeries and in restaurants and, and those stuff. And they try to like make the Taliban understand that okay, we are not journalists anymore and we are, we are not able to uh, work in that field. So to, to, to just be safe. And, and that's also not clear. Like, any time that they can get arrested and they can get punished for what they did during the republic. Mm -hmm. And for female journalists, like Afghanistan is the worst place to be a woman now in, in, because they are not able to work. A very limited number of women are working in medicine and in primary schools, that's all. And like with journalists, they, the Taliban has problems with journalists. A friend of mine got wounded in, in an explosion in March. There was like a hour ceremony for journalists and then who knows who placed a bomb inside that hall and it went off and like five journalists were wounded in that explosion. And one of those was my friend. And when he said like when he he became conscious in the hospital the sound that was heavier than the sound of explosion was that the conversation between two Taliban fighters who said that they wish all these journalists killed, got killed in that explosion and why they survived and why they were there to, to help them. So that, that's the Taliban mindset about journalists. They don't want journalists to be around. So women journalists, if they have like a male family member who can work, that's good. Otherwise, like they're starving and they're just trying to get some aid cards that they will provide them basic food needs. But that's also very restricted. So that that's why like almost 90% of people are facing the risk of starving because they don't have any job and that the, the government, the, the current regime is not providing any support for them. Presumably, you have family members still in Afghanistan and friends. What do you worry the most about for them? So the, the biggest worry is that, that they are not safe, and, and many of them had to change their place of living in the provinces or the areas that they were living. They had to change those places and move to other places. And the second thing is that we don't lose them for, from starving. So those who has got like a friend or a family abroad, they're lucky because they will get something. And, and we have to like make some extra money to send to them. Like those are the lucky ones. But uh, the, the others, they, 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 like I talked to some families a couple of weeks ago, they, they are not able to afford to pay for medicine, they're not able to, to pay for food. And, and there is like a government who's a regime in charge who says like everything is fine, there's no problem. And these are like small issues. If you're starving, like keep starving for another year, then things will be fine. Um, are there other questions? Okay, I see a question here. Um, there's, there's somebody right here. And please introduce yourself. Yeah, I didn't sorry. know it. Uh, my name is Edward Bradley. I'm a retired member of the Dartmouth faculty. Uh, given uh, what we understand to be the desperate economic status of Afghanistan today, with a large part of the population dependent upon humanitarian aid simply to have food to eat, is there any possibility of uh, uh, the Afghanis who are not sympathetic to the Taliban uh, organizing themselves in some kind of revolt and overthrowing the government that is really not a government? So the Taliban had a very aggressive approach toward any resistance. And they, there was, uh, right after the collapse, there was like small units of anti-Taliban uh, 
resistance in, in pine shear in valleys and in mountains, but, but they were aggressively attacking them using the uh, aircraft that were provided by U.S. to the Republic. And, uh, and, and even if, like, they have, now they notified people in, in, in many neighborhoods, in, in non-Pashtun areas where the, the residents are, like, from in northern and other places that historically they didn't support the Taliban, uh, they, they notify them that if they have guests, they should let their names uh, know by the officials. So like if you have a gathering of like 20 people, you should coordinate it before with the Taliban. Otherwise they will come and like arrest everyone and ask why, why they're there. So it, it is very difficult and, and people are already like tired of this 40 years or 50 years of war. But with the time, there is no other solution. There, there will be a resistance. But, but for now, because the Taliban are very aggressive and people are also they don't have any resources. There is, and, and no one is interested in Afghanistan to support them. So it, is, it, it, it doesn't seem very, very possible now, but eventually that's the only solution. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, what, what is your understanding of the status of the Masood movement right now? So the problem with Masood's movement is that his son is leading the movement. Ahmad Masood, and, and he is, uh, he's not in Afghanistan. So that's why it's not making any sense, because all resources and money is with him, but he's living in Tajikistan. And like there are some members of, former members of Afghan commandos who are really committed to fighting against the Taliban. They're still in those mountains, and they're, they're, they're really trying hard. And they, they have very high casualties, like in every attack. Today, three of them got killed. Yesterday, seven of them got killed. So, and, and no one is providing any support and resources for them. So I, I'm, and unless he himself is on the ground, that will make a lot of sense. And then there will be a lot of people uh, getting interested in this movement, and they will gather against him. But now people think it is a business for him that he just collect money, but he's not there to fight. And he just asks poor people to fight, and how long they will fight. Do they control any territory? No, not at all. They're just up in mountains. I This is too much of an opportunity to talk to you. I'm going to let this go a little bit after um, the official end time, which is 6.30, although I understand that, um, I know time flew. I see people surprised looking at their watches. Um, I'm going to keep going, but if you need to leave, that's okay um, for just another five or maximum ten minutes. Um, I want to ask a question because you've got real insight into journalism here in America compared to, you know, how it was practiced back home before all of this happened. What have been your biggest surprises in adapting to a news environment, a newspaper environment in the U.S.? What have been, what surprised you about that? So uh, I, I thought because it was like, it's such a big country and like it's such a big power, so I thought uh, people in this country will be interested in news all over the world. But when I started working for Pittsburgh Tribune Review, I realized that they were only interested for the news in their own city, mm. not mm. Uh, in the neighboring city even. Like, it, it, if it, it, the news is very local here. That surprised me. Like, for people in Afghanistan, it's very important to know what's happening with the US election, what's happening in Pakistan, what's happening in India, in Iran. But People here are very much individual, and they just care about what directly affect their life. So, like one of the the interesting memories for me was that when my editor asked me to go and report on a gas leak, he provided me with the location because I was very new to that area and I didn't know. So I I drive by and I saw there was only one track parked there, and, and there was n nothing big happening. So I said, okay, no, this is not the location. 
I came back to the office and I said, are you sure that was, that's the location? Because there's <laughs> only one truck and like there are two guys working. He said, yeah, there's like a small leakage and they're trying to repair it. I said, are we writing a story about it? He said, yes. I said, okay. <laughs> and I went back and like started talking to people. That, that surprised me so. And that's Pittsburgh. Imagine what Hanover News is like. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the audience here? Cause I, okay, um, and your name is? Or, uh, uh, take that so that our remote listeners can hear it. Um, I'm Ginger, I'm a 24 and I'm a Gov major, but this is an easier question maybe. What are you working on right now with your Harvard Fellowship? Sorry? What are you working on right now with your Harvard Fellowship? Yeah, so my, my, uh, my project after the fellowship is to um, write a long form story on uh, my Afghan migrants and, and their race settlement uh, challenges in the U.S. Because there is, there is not a proper uh, refugee support system in the U.S. And, and people really struggle a lot. Like it's, it's kind of, when, when you see the, this country from outside, it's like the land of opportunities. But when you are here, it, it, it really sucks. So uh, I have been talking to so many people who were in this country like in, in past five, six years. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing uh, a research on how they're adapting to this country and how is the community support and how like migrant communities try their best to always be in areas where they have like an older community. So, so I'm trying to make a sense of that. Okay, we can take one more question at this point, and I saw a hand over here, or no? Okay, and right here. Yeah, hi, I'm Randy Ringer, just a member of the community. I'm assuming that you knew that the Taliban couldn't be trusted as related to their promises relating, say, to women's rights. Why was the American government so willing to accept that the Taliban would honor their promises? I think uh, for Americans were trying to leave Afghanistan and they all like from from the Anglo wars they understand that leaving Afghanistan is not something easy like it, it there could be a, a lot of casualties when when they are trying to leave so they were just they were not caring about the woman rights and human rights in Afghanistan they were just caring about leaving Afghanistan without any casualties and that's what they did they knew that the moment they leave this country, there would be a catastrophe and people will be suffering, women will be buried from education. Because Taliban is an ideology. It's not like a group of people who can change. They think this is right. And, and, and it's impossible to, to convince them because they related to religion, the religion that they, they don't understand because it's in Arabic. But that's how they interpret it. And they say, well, that's how it is. And they're not open for negotiation about it. And also, like, um, the, the U.S. never discussed these things with them. Like, they, they, they only discussed the withdrawal and, and stopping Taliban from, from attacking American forces. They said, well, all these things are, like, internal issues and Afghans can discuss. And there was no discussions between Afghans because the Taliban didn't take Afghan delegation serious. They were, they were just making fun of them. Um, well, um just as a last thought, I'd like you to leave. I know there's some students here who might be interested in going into journalism or into you know, issues pertaining to Afghanistan or the region. Do you have any advice for them or ideas um, for them to send them on their way into the world of work? Yeah, I think um, like journalism is, if, if, you, if you want to help people, if you want to have an impact with your stories, I think it, it, it's, it's a great profession and, and you get that opportunity. But, but it has its challenges too. Uh, unless if you are very into changing lives, that can happen, like the, your stories can change lives. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, for coming here, for joining us. It's been a real treat and an honor for us to learn from you. And thank you to everybody who joined us here and remotely. And be sure to check the Rocky website to learn about our future events. 
Um, and thanks for being a part of this educational opportunity. Thank you for being here. Thank you.